Hi, welcome to Profit Sense. I am Shay Krejcik, a certified public accountant with Langorman Trubit. I have extensive knowledge in partnership, corporate, and individual income taxes. I am also the president-elect and 2019 president of the Dallas chapter of CRU and a partner here at Lane Gorman Trubit. And my name is Jennifer Grammer. I am also a tax supervisor and CPA here at Lane Gorman Trubit. I specialize in commercial real estate and gift, trust, and estate taxes. I love the Texas Rangers and I support UNT Mean Green. All right, today we are going to talk about the tax reform that was actually signed into law last year, but now most of us are going to see the effects of it going into this 2018 tax year filing season. So we're kind of going to go over some frequently asked questions we've been getting from many people and answering them and hoping this will help you guys get ready for your 2018 tax year. So let's start off with um, an individual question that we get asked a lot, which is what happened to the deductions on an individual 1040 tax return? Shay? Well, that can be pretty broad. Um, the most we hear about are obviously the property and state and local income taxes. On Schedule A, previously they were not limited outside of other limitations, but now individuals can only take up to 10,000 total of your property taxes and state income taxes. So if you're with a company that files in a lot of states, that can have a big impact if you're paying many state income taxes. Also on Schedule A, they repealed the 2% itemized miscellaneous deductions. And so that's, you know, your investment fees, your unreimbursed employee expenses, all of that stuff has been repealed now and cannot be deducted. And then your standard deductions went up quite a bit to 12000 for individuals or 24000 for married filing joint. And then they also took away the exemptions. So there were quite a bit of changes to deductions. Um, I think you'll see more people filing using the standard deduction rather than the itemized deduction since they increased it so much. Um, but also you'll see more people, you know, maybe talking to their companies about how the reimbursements are going to change. All right, we talked about how the deductions were changing on the individual return and how some are disallowed. Let's go into how the tax rates change because that is also a question I get asked quite a bit and if it can maybe help absorb some of these disallowed deductions. The change in the tax rates should definitely help offset some of those disallowed deductions, seeing that the maximum individual tax rate decreased from 39.6% to 37% for individuals, and the threshold amounts for each tax bracket also increased. Well, those were the changes to the individual tax rates. Did the corporate tax rate change? What about pass-through entities? Can you enlighten us on that? Now that you mention it, there was a pretty big change to the corporate tax rates. There is now a flat 21% corporate tax rate for corporate income taxes. What is keeping people from converting partnerships and S-corps to corporations to take advantage of this flat 21% rate? The answer to that would be the new 20% QBI or Qualified Business Income Deduction for pass-through entities that's available for partnerships and S-corps. This was enacted with the new tax law to help even out the new corporate tax rate. It doesn't necessarily even it out. Prior, the um, kind of rate swing between corporations and what individuals were paying on their investments was about 11%, and that's just rounding. And so now what this does is, assuming the top rate for individuals, it drops it down to where there's still about a 10, 11% rate difference between the two. But also, it's not just the rate that's different. The exit strategy, if you're in a corporation, is not as attractive. So if you're intending on you know, taking money out of your business, you're not necessarily reinvesting it, you have an exit strategy planned for later, it's not always a good idea to just immediately convert to a C-Corp. That's one of those instances where you would contact your CPA and talk about the different options available and kind of get a picture of it. 
And also, um, C corporations are technically still double taxed whenever you do take those distributions as dividends. So just because you have the 21% corporate tax, you're still going to be paying taxes on money that you take out of the corporation as a shareholder, not shareholder, shareholder. Yeah, as a shareholder. As a shareholder. Yeah. yeah. Well, and that rate would be if you took, you know, dividends out and assuming you're at that highest rate, you would end up being paying 49% tax rate on those, on your income from the corp and then taking into those dividends too. So the biggest thing is you need to talk to your CPA and just figure out what your long-term goal is and figure out you know, what you're really trying to do with the business and what your ultimate goal is as the owner. You know, I would like to dive into that 20% deduction more for the pass-through entities because I do get quite a bit of questions about that. And I don't think this podcast has the time to go into all the nitty gritty details, but it's good to know kind of top level something you can do. And I'm sure people are working with their CPAs on this. If your taxable income is right around that 315000 mark, if you're married up to 415000 you need to get with your CPA because if you can keep your taxable income under that amount, you don't get hit with any of the limitations that they have put in place for that 20% deduction. So one of the biggest hurdles is if you're in a specified service industry, which the list can go on for days. But if you are in a service industry and you do make more than that threshold of 315 to 415,000, you will not be able to take advantage of this 20% deduction. So to recap, what you're saying is that clients should get with their CPAs to be able to create a plan in order to fully utilize this 20% deduction and jump through all the hoops that are necessary. That's correct. Sounds good. Let's get back to some of our frequently asked questions. And one of the things that I feel like we get asked a lot is what happened to AMT and the DPAD deduction? AMT is alternative minimum tax for those of you that don't know. And for corporations, it was actually repealed, which is very exciting. But for individuals, they did leave it in place. They did increase the exemption amount and with the cap on property and state and local taxes of 10000 and the repeal of that 2% miscellaneous itemized deductions, less people will be subject to the alternative minimum tax. Um, and then also for DPAD, which is the Domestic Production Activities Deduction, they have completely repealed that, so you will not see that available on your business returns or your individual returns. Um, With those two big changes, Jennifer, another question we get asked a lot is, were there any changes to the um, cap bag? So if you're purchasing equipment, did they make any big changes with depreciation on that? Now that you mention it, there was quite a few changes to depreciation in general. One of them being there is now 100% bonus depreciation from 9-27-2017 through 2022. And then after 2022, the bonus depreciation drops 20% per year after that. Now, the difference between bonus depreciation and Section 179 expensing of capital assets is bonus depreciation can be taken whether you have business income or loss. So you can increase your loss with bonus depreciation. For 179 expensing, the limit increased to $1 million, and the phase-out threshold increased to $2.5 million. So what that means is new assets placed in service can be expensed using Section 179 up to $1 million. Now, is there a limitation on taking 179 Yeah, so like I said before, on the bonus depreciation, you can increase your loss using bonus depreciation. But for 179 you can only take that expense up to your net income. So you cannot decrease your income below zero using 179 expensing. The main question is, why wouldn't you utilize bonus and just create a big loss? I mean, are there any limitations there? That is a great question, Jennifer. There are some loss limitations, and I'm not going to go into, with this podcast, the ones that have been in effect. I'm just going to go into the new one and then some changes to ones. 
All right, on your personal returns, they have enacted this new excess business loss. And what that means is if you have a business loss that is in excess of 250,000 if you're single or 500,000 if you're married filing jointly, you can't take that loss, it'll be limited. So the most you can take in a business loss on your personal return if you're married is 500,000. And then that will, whatever is not used up, will then carry forward to future returns and convert into a net operating loss. So in 2018 and going forward with net operating losses that were created in 2018, I just wanna reiterate that you can only take 80% against your taxable income. Now, if you had a loss in effect 2017 and prior, you still get to take 100% of that. It's just the 2018 generated losses and going forward that is being limited. So when you're planning all of these deductions, you just need to you know, look at your individual impact and see what happens. Now that net operating loss limitation is also the same for corporations. So if you're a corporation and you have a loss that is generated in 2018 and going forward, it will be limited to 80% of taxable income as well. Last but not least, I wanna go into the question I am asked the most, and that is what are the changes to meals and entertainment? Well, the biggest change is that entertainment is no longer deductible. In prior years, inter- meals and entertainment were both 50% deductible. But going forward from 2018, meals will still be 50% deductible generally, and entertainment is no longer deductible. So, for example, if you were to take a prospective client or current client out to lunch, that meal would be 50% deductible. However, if you were to take the same client to a sporting event, the tickets for that sporting event would no longer be deductible. Well, in saying that, would you recommend, you know, people look at how they're coding their expenses and, you know, if they're doing a sponsorship, making sure they're categorizing everything correctly to be able to take full advantage? I would definitely recommend that. The more that you can separate out your meals and entertainment, the easier it will be to determine the deductibility of those on your tax return. Thank you, everybody, so much for joining us. This wraps up our podcast today. Obviously, there are many, many aspects of the tax reform that we couldn't touch on today and a lot of the nitty-gritty, but we really appreciate you joining us and look forward to having one in the future. You can follow us on LinkedIn at Lang Gorman Trubit, and you can also click the link below to subscribe for future podcasts, videos, and information. LGT specializes in a number of industries and offers audit, consulting, and tax services. You can find out more information about LGT at lgt-cpa.com. Thanks again for tuning in. I'm Jennifer Grammer, and we'll see you next time. The material and information contained in this audio recording is current as of the date produced and is for informational and entertainment purposes only. It should not be relied upon without seeking tax advice specific to your personal facts and circumstances. Any advice in the recording is not intended by the participants or Lang Gorman Trubit LLC to be used by a client or any other person or entity for the purposes of avoiding penalties that may be imposed on any taxpayer or promoting marketing or recommending to another party any matters addressed herein.